Sklar, um, the chair of the Native Plant Appreciation Month for the state of Washington. And I'm here with one of my committee members, Julie O'Donnell. So I wanna wish everybody a happy Earth Day, 51 years of Earth Day. And thank you for coming in to watch a video, a um, webinar presentation for Native Plant Appreciation Month, which occurs all months long, long. We have lots of hikes coming up this weekend and we have um, videos that are, this one's being recorded and we have videos that have been recorded all the way back to last April for our first Native Plant Appreciation Month, which you were all welcome to go and view. So now that Julie has retired from her career in public education, she devotes her time to educational outreach regarding the importance of growing native plants and creating habitat gardens. Julie is a wildlife habitat steward with the National Wildlife Federation. She's a team leader of a community wildlife habitat in Sonomish County, and she's a Washington Native Plant Society volunteer. In addition to growing over 200 species of native plants, Julie's focus has been on observing the usefulness of native plants for native bees, butterflies, and birds. Please join me in welcoming Julie O'Donnell. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, before we begin, I'd like to tell you about a Washington Native Plant Society stewardship project that I've been working on. It's a pollinator meadow located at the Northwest Stream Center in Southeast Everett at McCollum Park. The Northwest Stream Center is the location for the Adopt-A-Stream Foundation's educational programs. There's a half mile raised boardwalk and a trout stream viewing exhibit. The opportunity to create a native plant meadow for pollinators complements the educational mission of the Adopt-A-Stream Foundation. This photo was taken back in early March, and now that it is April, swamp lanterns light up the wetlands. In May, we'll be expecting migrating warblers, so each month there is something to see. With support from the Central Puget Sound Chapter Stewardship Grant, the plantings not only attract bees and butterflies, they engage visitors as well. The plant list is available at streamkeeper.org or even better, come and see for yourself. There's a small fee for entry and it's worth it. And there's a uh, reservation system in place right now to socially distance everyone along the boardwalk. So that's actually kind of a nice thing. And um, just in, hope you find a chance to come up and visit each month has something to offer. And as we begin the program, you might want a pen and paper handy so you can jot down the books, websites, and plants that are mentioned. Tonight, we'll be looking at some of the many native pollinators that are found in Puget Sound gardens, parks, and natural areas. The majority of the photos were taken in our garden by my daughter, Megan, including those shown here. We'll look at the char characteristics that identify these insects, and I'll discuss features in the landscape that allow pollinators to coexist with human activity. A pollinator can be any insect, bird, or animal that transfers pollen from one flower to another flower of the same species. Successful pollination results in the formation of fruit and seeds. Hummingbirds, butterflies and moths, bees, beetles, flies and wasps that visit flowers may all contribute to pollination. Bats that pollinate are found in Southwest deserts, in Mexico and in tropical areas, but not here. <clears throat> Native plants are those that were found locally before the arrival of Europeans and the plants they introduced. They are best adapted to the local soils and climate and they're co-adapted 
co-evolved, and co-dependent with local pollinators. Pacific ninebark attracts native bees and butterflies when it flowers in May. The genus Physocarpus is found across North America, and the East Coast species is often sold here because it has an ornamental purple-leaved form. To find the locally adapted native shrub, look for the species name Capitatus. For those east of the Cascades, you might prefer Physocarpus malvaceus or mallow ninebark that grows in eastern Washington. These honeybees, Apis mellifera, are not native to North America. They are a domesticated insect that was brought here from Europe and elsewhere, so they are not the topic of tonight's program. Instead, we'll learn about pollinators that are native to our region. Insect pollination is required for many food crops and approximately 85% of the world's flowering plants. In the wake of colony collapse disorder that's affected honeybees since 2006, interest in native pollinators has increased. It's been found they do an excellent job pollinating crops when they have adjacent natural areas where they can nest and overwinter. Estimates in the value of pollination by native bees in North America amounts to billions of dollars annually. This program follows the story of our family garden. And the inset photo shows there were few trees and wildlife was scarce when we moved here. These books by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the National Wildlife Federation guided the plant choices that brought this half acre to life. The plantings become increasingly natural toward the back where a small meadow with wildflowers leads into a woodland with native plants. And here's that Pacific nine bark. It's pretty large. This is a certified wildlife habitat. And that just means I filled out a checklist of wildlife and pollinator friendly practices that are used here. No garden is too small. Even a patio with flowering plants can be habitat for pollinators and still be important. Certifying with National Wildlife Federation supports education and connects us with a network of pollinator activities across North America. This is a closer look at the far back where pink flowered Pacific rhododendron and red huckleberry grow together with oso berry, mock orange, twinberry, and vine maple to provide a succession of nectar and pollen. This is where thimbleberry, salmon berry grow with enough room to spread and where logs and brush piles offer potential nest sites for pollinators and birds. Plant layers create habitat from ground covers and ferns, low to tall shrubs and upward to trees, supporting bees, butterflies, beneficial insects and birds. Before we move on to bees, it's worth knowing that most butterfly caterpillars feed only on specific native plants. Stinging nettles are the primary food plant for the Red Admiral, Seder Anglewing, and Milbert's tortoise shell. Nettles uh, don't grow well in gardens. They spread aggressively by root and they sting. So this makes it even more important that we preserve them in green belts and natural areas if we wish to see these butterflies. Also know that if Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt is used to control moth caterpillars, it also kills butterfly larvae. They are uh, very closely related and I'll use larvae and caterpillars interchangeably and larval stage means that caterpillar stage for these insects. As a result of planting for butterflies, the garden filled with nectar rich flowers and we began to see many pollinators. In 2012, a citizen science project was organized by UW graduate student, Hillary Burgess. Hillary wanted to compare the difference between gardens with native plants 
and those without to find the effect that might have on pollinators. Megan and I volunteered so we could receive training and learn to identify the pollinators we observed. And I'd like to share with you some of what we learned. Starting with how to identify these insects. Bees and wasps share several characteristics. They both have long antennae, eyes along the sides of the head and four wings. They differ in that bees provision their nests with pollen as a protein source for their larvae. They have branched hairs on their legs and their body called scopa that are especially effective at collecting pollen. So right here, let's look at this, this insect. If you weren't sure, if you were outside and you saw this and you thought maybe it looks like a wasp, but now you've learned it's got these very furry legs and its head and even its thorax. And that indicates this is a bee. So I'm pretty sure you know that's a wasp, but how do we know that's a wasp? It also has long antennae, eyes along the side of the head, has a narrow waist, pointed abdomen, and a smooth shine. So wasps provision their nests with insects as a protein source. So they don't actively collect the pollen, but they do sometimes have single hairs, and if they're visiting flowers, they can still help pollinate. So then down here, what is this? Well, it is kind of furry, but look at the eyes. They're across the top of the head and very short antennae. And these are characteristics of a fly. And if um, you can't really see it on a living insect, but if we had a dead insect, we would see this only has two wings compared with bees and wasps that have four wings. So let's start with bumbles, bumblebees. They are among the most widespread of native pollinators. And we have as many as 14 species here in Western Washington with 25 species statewide. Bumblebees form colonies with one queen and many workers. So they are considered a social bee. And their identification is complex because different species share similar color patterns. Bumblebees of North America and Xerces.org explain this in detail. Bombus fosnesenskii is the most common bee in many parts of the coastal areas of the West, including here in Western Washington. And we can see that big yellow bump is a corbiculum or pollen basket. And that indicates this is a female. Only queens and worker bees collect the pollen and return with it to tend the brood cells. So only females, queens, and workers have a pollen basket. To understand the life cycle of a bumblebee, let's start here in late winter, <laughs> about one o'clock. This is when queen bumblebees emerge from overwintering. As they find enough nectar and pollen, they'll start looking for a nest site. And when there is an ample supply, they'll lay the eggs that become the first worker bees. As we move down to around four or five o'clock, the queen stays in the nest, and lays eggs, and the workers emerge and go and forage. By mid to late summer, the workers begin to die off. And about this time, males and new queens emerge. They mate, and by the end of the season, everyone dies off other than the, the new queen. The new queens continue to forage up until frost, and then they overwinter under leaves in old rodent burrows, um, stacks of dry wood, brush piles, and a queen bumblebee lives about one year. This photo was taken in early September and it compares the size of the large queen to the small male. Autumn Hellenium is a native wildflower that blooms in late summer and autumn. Garden centers sell hybrid varieties and hybridization often results in a reduced amount of nectar and pollen. To support pollinators, look for species forms of our native plants at native plant sales. 
there is a relatively new website, WashingtonBumblebees.org, and it is a gem. It's a wonderful kind of a gift to us. I wish we'd had this when I was trying to learn all these bumblebees because um, bumblebees are very complicated and their identification is tricky. And this website makes it um, easier than, and than any other website or book that I've seen. And so uh, if you are interested in learning about Washington bumblebees, please visit WashingtonBumblebees.org. So berries, both native and cultivated, have a mutualistic relationship with bumblebees. The bumblebees pollinate the flowers along with hummingbirds, both bumblebees and hummingbirds pollinate flowers of evergreen huckleberry. And as a result of the pollination, there are berries for people, birds, and wildlife. Raspberries and blueberries also rely on pollination by bumblebees. After observing and photographing our pollinators and bumblebees all summer, one day Megan noticed an unusual bee. We were, un we were aware certain bees were in decline and she noticed this bee, bumblebee that has unusually white tail segments. She sent the photos to the Xerxes Society in Portland and they sent them to Stanford. And Stanford confirmed this is Bombus occidentalis, the Western bumblebee. And uh, it is um, in serious decline. And even there, even then in 2012 considered fairly unusual and rare. So at the time there were still remnant, remnant populations. So finding one was pretty exciting and they are still being found in other parts of the state but they are extremely rare here in Western Washington. So just for comparison, there's a honeybee and some smaller native bees. This photo was taken in Oregon by conservation biologist, Rich Hatfield. At one time, this was the most common bumblebee in the Western United States. And to understand what happened to them, it helps to know that bumblebees can vibrate their wing muscles between 200 and 300 times per second. This allows them to warm themselves and fly in cool weather and it also lets them buzz pollinate the flowers of new world crops such as cucumbers, um, pumpkins, and blueberries. Western bumblebees were in demand for greenhouse grown peppers and tomatoes as a pollinator. Back to that. In the 1990s, Western bumblebee queens were sent to breeding facilities in England. Well, I'm not certain it was England, I think so, but Europe at any rate. When they were shipped back to the United States, it's believed they carried a European pathogen. That's been thought to be the culprit in their decline. This is being taken very seriously because closely related bumblebees, such as the Franklin's bumblebee of Oregon and California, are now thought to be extinct. There's an interesting video titled The Old Man and the Bee on CNN that takes us out in the field with a bumblebee researcher. And I've watched it several times. I really enjoy it, but it's five or six minutes. So I didn't want to spend time on it tonight. But if you have a chance, please do a search for The Old Man and the Bee. It's on YouTube, but be sure to add CNN to the title or you'll come up with cartoons and things that are totally unrelated. So I hope you find time to watch that. Fairy Bells is a delicate wildflower of the woodland edge. In a few minutes, we will see more flowers, but first let's look at some of the lesser known pollinators. Bees that build an individual nest without a queen or workers are known as solitary. Mason bees, sweat bees, mining and leaf cutter bees are common examples. On the lower right, the scopa on the legs of a tiny sweat bee are covered with yellow pollen. Blue orchard mason bees are active from March or April, depending where you live, 
at the right time to pollinate fruit trees. Each female builds an individual nest and like other solitary bees, she spends all her time foraging and nest building. There are no workers to defend the nest, so they are unlikely to sting. Mason bees only pollinate within 300 feet of their nest and they need a source of mud to seal their brood chambers. As few as 250 mason bees can pollinate one acre of apple trees where 15,000 or more honeybees are needed to accomplish the same level of pollination. Some reasons for their effectiveness are their larger body allows them to dislodge and transfer more pollen and their, ability, their tolerance of flying in cold and wet weather. Approximately 70% of native bees nest underground. Even if you don't intend to plant something, reducing long can improve the chance that ground nesting pollinators will have access to nest sites. These are the nests of solitary mining bees that are grouped together in a suitable location. They prefer an area with sandy soil that's well-drained and doesn't receive supplemental water or irrigating in summer. Here's the face of one of those little bees in its nest. You can see one of the antenna. And metallic green sweat bees have similar nest requirements. Now both photos are taken, were taken locally in the suburbs, so these bees are around. And entomologist Douglas Tallamy tells us that in the United States, we've converted an area eight times the size of New Jersey into lawn. He further says, if we convert half that area back to native plants, over 20 million acres will become available for pollinators, birds, and wildlife. Talamy's books are filled with insightful ideas on how we can have help nature in our gardens. And his newest book, Nature's Best Hope, has information on pollinators. Now, I believe these are nests of sweat bees in the genus Halictus, and they are nesting in a rock garden in North Seattle where they found an ample supply of sandy, gravelly soil that's well-drained and doesn't get too much water in summer. Okay, take a moment, think about what we talked about earlier, how to recognize insects. This photo captures the iridescence of the insect's wings. Well, look at its eyes. They're large eyes across the top of the head and tiny antenna, antennae. And that helps identify it as a hoverfly that belongs to a large family of flower flies. And hoverflies are also called surfid flies. And close focus binoculars can help to see these details. The Seattle Audubon store has a good selection. Bottle flies also pollinate as they visit flowers. They're found in these shiny metallic shades of blue and green with single hairs. On the right, we have a bee-like insect, a lot of hair, pretty much furry. And on the left, we can see its face. And there are those big eyes across the, that meet across the top of the head, very small antennae. And that helps identify this as a Narcissus bulb fly. It's a bumblebee mimic. So even though it's furry, those hairs aren't branched scoping. If we had the insect in, under a microscope, we'd be able to see that. And wasps also transfer pollen. This is called a bee wolf because it hunts bees to feed its larvae. Here the adult is finding nectar on goldenrod and perhaps pollen for its own food supply. The potter wasp builds a small solitary mud nest. They are beneficial and eat the larvae of spruce budworm and alfalfa weevil. Because wasps are predators of other insects, 
they often help with insect control. As with solitary bees, each female builds her own nest. And since there are no workers to defend the nest, she is unlikely to sting. She's just too busy. I like seeing the potter wasp. They are a sign of a healthy landscape. Even beetles pollinate as they visit flowers. And the fossil record suggests that they were among the first pollinators of Jurassic period flowering plants about 150 million years ago. So they are a very primitive pollinator. These appeared closer to 100 million years ago for comparison. And in the last few years, the European wool carter bee has arrived in Washington state. They have black and yellow wasp-like markings and they are kind of territorial. They'll chase you off, they'll chase the other bees, the other pollinators away. And so territorial and a little aggressive, it's not yet known how they will affect the local pollinators. So that um, completes the beginning part of the program. And now we'll move on to garden practices. And the first thing to know, and you already know this, is that it's time to reduce our use of garden chemicals. In the United States, over 100, 100 million acres of corn, wheat, soy, and cotton are treated with neonicotinoid pesticides annually. And as more land becomes uh, turned and converted to large scale agriculture, that number increases. So I'd like to read this quote from the Center for Food Safety. It's dated November, 2020. US farmland is 48 times more toxic to insects like pollinators than it was 25 years ago. So we wonder why we have pollinator decline and, and that's a big part of it. Um, so let's talk about this tree. This is a linden tree and it's used uh, in or as an ornamental. It has small flowers that attract bumblebees, but they're hard to see from the ground. It also attracts aphids and aphids secrete a sticky substance and increase the chance the tree will be sprayed to eliminate the aphids. So in June, 2013, 50 flowering linden trees were sprayed at a shopping center in Wilsonville, Oregon. It's estimated that 100,000 bumblebees or more were killed. They blanketed the parking lot. So in addition to agriculture, pesticide use on ornamentals further contributes to pollinator decline. It's increasingly common for seeds to be pretreated with neonicotinoids. Because neonics are systemic, all parts of the plant are toxic after the seed sprouts, including the nectar and pollen. So choosing organic can help protect pollinators. Plants may also be pretreated. And I let garden centers know I'm looking for pesticide free plants that are safe for bees and butterflies as indicated on this label. In addition, look for old fashioned single flowers like this autumn millennium that are more likely to supply a full complement of nectar and pollen than hybrids and double flowered varieties. To create a meadow, choose an area in full sun and plant goldenrod, aster, and lupin. Fireweed is an excellent plant for pollinators where it has room to spread. It really is an aggressive spreader. Think of a clear cut. That's where fireweed will just beautifully fill in a clear cut. So in my own garden, I have it growing in the shrub border and I do pull advancing stems every so often to keep it in check, but it's just so beautiful, I wouldn't be without it. 
but it's natural for these plants to spread. So be sure to give them the room they need to do that and avoid planting them with the rest of your delicate flower gardens because they may just overwhelm a flower garden or tangle up with your roses or something like that. So I like to say, create an area where they can be themselves and spread and do the best good for pollinators. These leaves have been used by leaf cutter bees. The, the long pieces line the sides of the bee's nest and the round pieces fit on the ends. There are um, many kinds of leaf cutter bees and I'm really happy to see this. These very exacting shapes tell me the garden has leaf cutter bees and that's a good thing. So here's another, another species. And one way entomologists identify insects is by the pattern of veins on the wings. And they would do this under a microscope with a dead insect and they'd be looking at um, a key that would help lead them to identify what uh, kind of bee it is. So that we have lots of leafcutter bees locally and our main uh, pollinator in the summer that's native are the bumblebees and they are mostly doing pretty well. And so there's no need to purchase leafcutter bees for summer pollination and doing so may even harm the bees that are already here by increasing competition for nest sites and for food for nectar and pollen. Allowing fallen leaves to remain on the ground gives bumblebees a place to overwinter. And here we have a yellow-faced bumblebee. Those are snowdrops behind it. So that was very early spring and it's emerging. This is the same area. And um, it has overwintered, I'm assuming nearby because it's still crawling around. It hasn't warmed up enough to fly away. So uh, leaves will serve as a mulch and they can just be raked under your trees and shrubs where they're available to pollinators. They don't need to be cleaned up. People will say, should I rake them up in June? No, just leave them year round. They're a terrific mulch when they decompose, they enrich the soil, they help suppress weeds, they help retain water. This is nature's mulch. So it's a good thing. Avoid, as far as pollinators go, wood chips, weed barriers and beauty bark all prevent pollinators from accessing the soil. <clears throat> there are approximately or close to 4,000 native bees in North America and 30% of them nest above ground and their nests can be found in logs, in twigs with hollow centers, in spaces in stacked wood, in undisturbed clumps of grass and spaces in rock walls. Even a small stump or log or snag can provide nest sites. Find a place to leave branches and logs on the ground for this purpose. Red elderberry has pithy stems that become hollow and it's used by many small solitary bees. So if you're in your garden and you're cleaning up twigs and stems and they have a hollow center, don't remove them altogether. Gather them up and place them back behind some shrubs out of the way so you don't have to look at them. But that way, if there are some bee larvae inside, they'll have the opportunity to emerge. There could even be some overwintering bees. Um, so it's best to just leave them somewhere in your landscape and let these pollinators complete their life cycle. Now, if snags are in short supply, some bumblebees will nest in a birdhouse. And we are looking at ventilation holes in the back of this uh, birdhouse. And um, bumblebees, they like a birdhouse that's been previously used. They'll uh, build on the nesting material that's already inside there. And so if you have this happen, try to appreciate you have native, your own bumblebees and go put up another birdhouse for the birds. I think it's worth it. It's pretty fun to watch them nest. You do need to keep your distance because they're a social bee and they can sting and bumblebees can sting more than once. And it 
their stinger hurts. I've only been stung probably once for all the watching I do. And that was because I was cleaning up, guess what, by hand, I was in my orchard and I was using my hand to uh, rake away gently some of the fallen leaves and there was a bumblebee in there and it stung right through my garden glove. So do be careful around their nests because they do have workers. And, um, but usually they'll just leave people alone. They're pretty fascinating. I, I walk around through many bumblebees. My garden is very alive with them. And uh, sometimes one will circle you. I'm told they're just trying to figure out what this big thing is moving through their area. Keep going. Um, don't swat at it. Just walk calmly away. And I think you'll find that uh, they really just don't bother anybody if we leave them alone. To supply water, and I think this is more critical in desert areas and the dry side of the mountains, but to supply water, you can add some sloping rocks and wood in a saucer. Insects will find water on wet leaves in the morning. And the both the uh, Mason bees and the beneficial potter wasp require a source of mud and mud may even attract butterflies. So I think if you have, don't do anything else, a source of mud might be the most important thing to add. <clears throat> the bees in your backyard gives a thorough introduction to many native bees. Butterfly Gardening by the North American Butterfly Association features gardens that include native plants. And I'm honored that my garden helps represent the section for the Pacific Northwest. Victory Gardens for Bees comes from Canada and dovetails nicely with today's program and attracting native pollinators and 100 plants to feed the bees were written by the Xerces Society, a leader in pollinator conservation. Xerces has launched Bumblebee Watch, a citizen science project, and invites people to submit their bumblebee sightings. So definitely check out their website. There's a lot to lot of interest there. There are great plant lists. I used to come to meetings and have all kinds of handouts and plant lists and, and I had Xerces information and National Wildlife Federation information. And um, anyway, you'll have to go to the websites now. So, but that works too. You know, we're using less paper that way, so it's okay. Okay, so one aspect of of creating and supporting pollinators, creating a garden or a restoration for pollinators is to provide a succession of nectar and pollen. And our native shrubs do this exceedingly well, beginning with willows in February and March, oso berry in March, and organ grape in March and April. A key benefit of the native plants is this overlapping succession of flowering times. And, you know, I wasn't aware of that when I began growing native plants, but I've observed it and it's just a fascinating thing that as one plant is finishing up another, there's just a little bit of overlapping, maybe a week or two, and uh, they, they have a true succession. So down here we have twinberry and it's a shrub form of honeysuckle and it attracts both hummingbirds and bumblebees beginning in April all the way into July. It has a long growing season. So another benefit of, of creating a pollinator area with sh native shrubs is not only that succession, but you've got this huge floral bouquet, <clears throat> an ample supply of nectar and pollen and often a longer flowering season. By May, there is plenty of nectar, plenty of flowers, including thimbleberry here and shrubs in the genus Ceanothus. If you are working with shade, then you would want to plant our evergreen huckleberry, red huckleberry, low Oregon grape, Mahonia nervosa, and vine maple. And um, they're all great, um, easy to grow, and they will attract pollinators in shade. So take a moment, see if you recognize this plant. These are the flowers of 
big leaf maple, Acer macrophyllum, and our orchard mason bees, and some bumblebees timed their emergence to the flowering time of this tree. Northwest biologists consider native maples and willows to be some of the most important trees for pollinators. Snowberry flowers from May all the way through the summer, through most of the summer, and it continues to flower even as these berries are forming late in the season and there's still flowers and it's still attracting the bumblebees. So this is an easy to grow, probably a must have in a shrub garden if you want to support pollinators and it's drought tolerant. It will flower best in full sun, but it does okay in bright shade and it will spread slowly to form a thicket. This is a very good plant for a dry hillside because it will help stabilize the slope. Various native penstemons and angelicas are not only beautiful and garden worthy, uh, the pollinators will come to them and they grow well in gardens that have good drainage. Western Columbine gives an example of the way native plants may meet the needs of more than one species. The bumblebee doesn't fit inside these narrow flowers, so it's piercing the side of the nectar tube, and that's called robbing nectar. In this case, the butterfly is doing a better job of pollination. <clears throat> Here we see a leaf cutter bee potter wasp and a beetle all foraging together on goat's beard. And this is another May flowering wildflower, does well in gardens and I check it every day because it also attracts butterflies when it's in bloom. So native plants are the foundation of habitat. They are beautiful and pollinators depend on them. In the time that remains, we'll look at the steps for converting lawn into habitat. In 2013, I was asked to create a pollinator garden at a middle school. We are looking at the south wall and four raised beds that were built for a garden club. Now the steps that follow can be used in lots of other settings. So I hope they'll apply to um, whatever you are doing. When we look from this angle, we can see that grounds workers have sprayed weed killer around the raised beds. This is still 2013 before any work had been done um, for the pollinator area. And we're looking west, there's a green belt and the green belt supplies the native trees and shrubs, the fallen leaves, the uh, snags, the logs and stumps. So good nest sites and overwintering habitat. And there is a fire hydrant. So we'll use that fire hydrant as a point of reference. Now, even though I was working with the garden club, permission was needed from the principal to make changes followed by approval from the school district grounds maintenance department, and they required a plan. So the first plan shows, here's the fire hydrant, here's the wall of the school, and then this projects out into the driveway a little bit. So it shows it's only about 14 feet wide, and it's about 36 feet all the way over to the um, rate, first raised bed. And I also submitted at the same time a larger site map, a plant list, and an installation plan with three stages. The school district did not want these larger shrubs. And so the second plant showed changes and allowed the project to move forward. And now um, this garden does include ornamentals and it's a mixture of natives and non-natives because it's a, it just um, a very small area and we have lo fortunately lots of native plants in the adjacent green belt. And um, I'm trying to go for fall and spring color because of the school year. So stage one site preparation began with overlapping sheets of cardboard. 
Beauty Bark was available on site at no cost. So we covered the cardboard with six to eight inches of Beauty Bark. By the end of June, the end of the school year, the mulching was complete and we left the garden area just sit for the summer so the cardboard could break down and kill the sod. I would have liked to have put uh, compost in the planting areas, but as it was, the beauty bark was fine for weighing down and hiding the cardboard. By autumn of 2013, um, wood chips were acquired free, you know, just a chip drop, free wood chips, and we spread those in areas that would become the paths. This photo was taken in January 2014 and marks uh, the end of site preparation and the beginning of planting with the first planting of goldenrod, aster, and Oregon grape. By May, one year after the first sheet mulching, the Garden Club students planted lavender, native birch leaf spirea, and evergreen huckleberry. Looking west that first summer, we can see the fire hydrant and the green belt. And this is where we added grasses that could be potential nest sites for bumblebees and a host plant for woodland skipper butterflies. Now this is a, I really love this area back here. It's really lightly maintained. We do very little work back here and it is where the native asters and the pearly everlasting grow and the goldenrod and everything can just spread. And as long as we keep the weeds out just once or twice a year, it's a real wildflower garden in this area. So it's very lightly maintained. And the clovers came up and they're not native, but they attract the bumblebees all summer. So we let them grow here. One year later, the plants had filled in and logs were added just got them out of the green belt and logs were added to outline the garden beds. And this was surprisingly helpful in keeping students and dog walkers on the paths. Also that summer, the garden club planted flowers for pollinators. With planting finished, stage two was complete and marked the beginning of stage three, general maintenance that includes edging, weeding, and replenishing wood chips. This photo was taken in May of 2016 and there's a green belt, but you can no longer see the fire hydrant. We have chives in the foreground in one of the beds, coral bells in the center and large leaf lupin in back. And they began a succession of nectar and pollen in May that continued into June. And by July, find my cursor here, birch leaves, spirea was flowering, there's lavender, coral bells was still in flower, and elegant clarkia in the background. So elegant clarkia is an annual wildflower from California, and it was planted from seed by the garden club. It attracted bumblebees from early to midsummer. just it was, everybody loved it, it was really beautiful. In July, goldenrod comes into bloom and it attracts many insects, including, okay, is it a wasp or a bee? You know, this is a bee because it's got lots of scopa on its legs and a little bit on other parts of its body. And it's not alone. A crab spider was poised, waiting to capture prey. It had taken on the yellow hue of the goldenrod. Looking west in September, the goldenrod had finished blooming and in its place, this is New England aster, it's an ornamental. Here's our autumn helenium. Here's fuchsia, hardy fuchsia and Joe pieweed from Eastern United States. And they continued to attract pollinators and they gave that big splash of color as students and staff returned. Now bees and birds came to this garden right away, but butterflies took a little longer. Here, a woodland skipper finally found its way to the lavender in August. 
And in September, a West Coast lady, Vanessa Annabella, spent most of a week on the, on the New England asters. This butterfly uses stinging nettles as a host plant. Oops. So um, goldenrod definitely demonstrates the same plant and they will come. Here we have Bombus vosnesenskii, a honeybee, and one, two, three, four other bees. It is truly alive with activity. So these photos were taken while standing near the fire hydrant from the first planting in January 2014 to a garden rich in nectar and pollen two and a half years later, it has been rewarding to see these changes. And I just wish you success and happy planting, happy Earth Day. Um, that's the end of this program. I'm happy to take your questions, but uh, this truly a joy to see what the flowers do and what they do for the pollinators. Thank you, Julie. So far we have two questions. Okay. You've done such a thorough job explaining everything. I've heard so many questions that I, I try to put the information out ahead of the question now. So, what are the shiny black ball areas on the top of bumblebees' heads? Yeah, there is a name for that, and um, I don't recall it at this moment. But if you look into some of the resources, you can find that information. It has a name. <laughs> okay. What is beauty bark? Oh, it's a mulch. Oh. It's a mulch that gardeners use. Um, usually they buy it in bulk. I think you can get it in bags, but people buy it in, you know, trailer load or pickup truck load. And it is a decomposed, um, it, it's kind of a woody decomposed type of substance and I, it varies. What's in it will vary from the suppliers. So, but people use it to mulch to make their uh, garden beds look really pretty and it, it looks cleaned up, but weeds grow in it like crazy. So you still have to weed. <laughs> hey, Jeannie Taylor said that that part is called the ocilii. Oh, thank you for looking that up. Appreciate that. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and asks, what are some good resources for buying native plants? Well, of course, your Washington Native Plant Society plant sales are, I think the ordering period might be wrapped up right now, but you could double check. I don't know if the Salal chapter still has a sit still has ordering. Um, I think it's finished for Central Puget Sound. Depends where you live. Most areas have specialty nurseries that uh, will sell native plants year round too. So I know there's uh, Tadpole Haven out in Woodenville. There's Go Natives in Shoreline. There's Krukerberg Botanic Garden in Shoreline. And even some of the bigger nurseries will sell some native plants. What is the name of the California native deep pink in the middle of the school? Oh, the, uh, the seeds, the, the elegant Clarkia. Elegant Clarkia, okay. Okay. That was a question from Nev. Okay, Kim Burley would like to know, what do you think about covering grass with clear plastic to solarize it over the summer and then layering with newspaper and other materials in the fall? Well, as long as you remove that plastic, you know, that's one way to get it done. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Denise Mankey writes to everyone, check out the WNPS resource for seeds and um, it came off. See, uh, native plant and seed sources updated annually. And that's in the chat. You can check that for yourselves. Um, a, um, I'm gonna go back up now and uh, many thank yous for a wonderful presentation. And what was the name of the flower you mentioned? Elegant Clarkii again, and you did mention that again. Um, yeah, Latin name is Clarkia unguiculata. It begins with U-N-G, unguiculata. Okay. And you can find those seeds. They're on the seed racks. Okay. Could you please share the slide with your book recommendations again? Sure. 
I'm just going to do it the slow way so I don't mess anything up here. Because it's somewhere out here in the middle. There we go. Oops, back. All right. Okay, maybe just leave it up while I ask. I will. <laughs> and share yeah. comments. And Jane uh, shares Clark College Native Plant Center in Southwest Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Jane says, great presentation. Thank you so much. Martha offers Tadpole Haven, and that I think is on our source. Yes. Um, Kat says, thanks for the great information. So um, that's all the questions and comments. So thank you very much. Um, oh, uh, Ann uh, says Northern Sonomish County, uh, maybe still having your plan sale, so. Okay, yep. Right, I know it's a hard year to get the plants. It's a little trickier than it used to be, but um, they're still out there, they're still available and just get started planting, it's so worth it. So thank you everyone. And this will be posted um, as soon as Denise can get it up for people to view and view parts of it again. Um, so thank you. And just for your, just so that you know, coming up this coming Tuesday is another marvelous uh, webinar, uh, Mountain Heather Ecology and Restoration Project in the Northern Cascade Mountains. And Thursday, Wildflowers, Introduction to the Flora of Washington and Idaho Borders. So you can sign up for both of these webinars by going to the WMPS.org website and sign up for those. Also check out our um, field trip destinations that have been posted. There are wonderful self-guided field trips and there are some plant lists included. And um, we have a Just for Kids link with coloring sheets and uh, a scavenger hunt for the shrub, shrub steps that is in English and Spanish um, on the website. And that's under the education tab. So check out those wonderful resources we have. And while you're at the WNPS website, why don't you click on all the tabs and see what you can see and learn. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Julie, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. You're very welcome. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Go plant something <laughs> native. Happy Good. Earth Day, all. Good night. Good night.